mind has a continuing question of what about tomorrow? And certainly we should plan for tomorrow, but to worry for tomorrow is something quite different that shouldn't be a part of our life. And this tomorrow question has a real good answer. And it comes from the Bible. And reading from James 4.13, this is what it says. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we'll go to this city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why do you not even know, why do you not even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? Indeed, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag. All such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. The church sign out front says something very well. Trust an unknown future to a known God. Mankind worries more about tomorrow than they do eternity. Romans has an answer for tomorrow and eternity. And then reading Romans 10, 9 and 10. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him the dead, you will be saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. The continuation of that scripture, and it must be always continued, day and night, 365 days a year, it will take care of you today and tomorrow, and it will take care of you in eternity. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come this day to give you your due glory. And one of the greatest ways we do that is by our faith that we place in you as your place as the living God. And yet the ultimate glory in which we recognize and receive your love. And that love comes in no greater way than the cross. The depth of your love was, was recognized when Jesus was willing on that cross. And he was the only way that we in our place of life could find an eternal home with you. The only way was Jesus Christ and his love. So we looked at the cross, the Savior's body that was broken there, punished for the world's sin. And yet that blood that was poured out was holy and pure. And he was willing to give it to our lives. And we will find eternity by our heart and soul surrendering to the cross. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Take the cup and be blessed in the name of Jesus Christ.
I'm going to sing Restore My Soul. <clears throat> Lord, you know that I've been foolish, I've been blind. I've let my doubts and my confusions cloud my mind. I have walked in my own wisdom, I've been wrong. Take my hand and lead me back where I Stripped of all that once I clung to, Lord, I come. Though in your eyes I know I'm nothing, yet I come. With your hand that once was nail-scarred just for me, touch me now and make me all that I should be. Good morning. Good morning. No, that was cool, wasn't it? Um, yeah, no, a friend of mine built that for us, so uh, that, I can't do that every week. Uh, but <laughs> I wish I could. I got to learn how to do that because that was that was pretty cool. Um, we are starting a new series uh, today called Collide, and the idea with this series is beginning to uh, really attack this this this. I don't want to say fight. But like I said, the inevitable collision between church and culture. Since the beginning of the church, there have been people who have tried to spread false teachings about what it means to be the people of God. Right? We see Paul constantly battling this. And Paul considered these hollow and straight lies from the pits of hell. He warned Christians to be careful what they believe to be true. He always encouraged believers to stand firm 
on the simple truths of the gospel. Right, the world tries to water down the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, and, and even spread false truths about what the gospel is. Now, being aware of this is, is by itself is not enough. Right? We have to make a choice to stand firm on the truth of the gospel. These deceptive truths, they're very enticing. They sound really pretty. They tickle our ears. But they will never provide you with the abundant life Christ came to, bring, uh, to bring us. See, you will need to get into a rhythm of standing firm on the gospel message. It becomes part of your everyday life, the rhythm of who you are. When you hear something deceptive or false, declare it as such and keep returning to the word of God for the real truth. When you hear it, declare it as false and go back to scripture. Let God bring that truth back out in you. And this week, we're going to begin this new series, uh, Collide, this collision that we are going to be in. If you've ever stood firm in your faith, in the face of something the world is throwing at you, 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 you can feel sometimes how it, it's kind of like a, a car accident. It's two completely opposite uh, forces smashing together. And so I want to encourage you, as, as Scripture does and as God does, to stand firm, steadfast in your faith. And, you know, since the beginning, right, the Christian faith has been on a collision course with the culture around it. Look at Jesus' ministry. Look at the ministry of the apostles, the first century church, and as it has continued all the way to us today. The values of the world do not align with the values of our faith. The priorities of this world do not align with the priorities of your faith. The kingdom of man is not seeking the same things as the kingdom of God. Because of all that, we shouldn't be surprised when we experience conflict and tension with the world around us. Instead, we should see the conflict and the tension as confirmation that we are doing the right thing. You are standing out for God. It's kind of like swimming against the stream. Now, if you would, just imagine for a moment, if you've ever seen the videos of the uh, salmon migration in Alaska when it's the spawning season, it's just floods and floods of fish swimming upstream, right, to get back to this one place that they were, they were born. And all of those fish, what you need to do is you need to be the one fish swimming against all of them. When you do, the conflict, the collision, the friction is natural. And so when we have that conflict, and the pressure that comes with it. It's a, it should be an encouragement that you're actually standing firm in your faith against what the world is telling you. So have you ever been on a hike or a walk and gone through a rough patch? Right? It's gotten really, really difficult. You know the kind where every time you put your foot down, you're not sure if you're going to roll an ankle or, or find solid ground. The footing is very unsure. Now, my favorite is trying to walk through ice-covered snow. Now, you guys have a little bit of an experience with it. There are times up in Wyoming where you're walking through snow, and it's hard pack, and then out of nowhere, you're thigh-deep in snow. And the fight, the struggle that it takes to get out of there, where any given step can send you airborne. Right? You can slip, fall, slide down the hill, whatever it may be. It's terrifying to walk through these rough patches to not know if we have sure footing. Now, these types of adventures are very much like walking through life, trying to uh, depend on worldly wisdom over godly wisdom. Godly wisdom is that sure footing. It's that solid ground. It never changes. It never has. It never will. But if you look at worldly wisdom, it changes with the wind. It's never sure, always changing. You're never quite sure, right? You're going to land on solid ground because the principles and values of this world are constantly shifting. They're like shifting sands. Right? We hear a lot about that in Scripture, don't we? Everybody shake your head yes. There we go. Y'all gonna wake up. But how, what do we learn in the Bible? Right? What do we learn from Jesus? We learn to trust in the consistent teaching of Scripture. Jesus always pointed back to Scripture. 
If you have your Bible, I want you to turn open to Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. If you don't have your Bible, you've got the Bible app on your phone, you can swipe and tap over. Or you can read on the screen next to me. I keep looking up because I usually have a TV back there, but we've got some issues going on, so it's not there. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that comes from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. So in this one verse, Paul warns us about the world's logic and values. He calls us, right? He calls believers to stand firm on a different set of values, those of Christ, right? The ones that don't shift, the ones that are full, they're not empty. It's not high sounding nonsense, but even when we choose to stand firm on the things of God, we will still be faced with values of this world. One of the things this world has, has done very well is we, we have set the standard that intelligence is of the highest uh, respect and that those who have the highest level of schooling and intelligence that they are just believed, period. You don't question that. I'm not saying that knowledge is not beneficial. It's great to know. But it's not it. The only it, the top of the rung, right? The top of the ladder is the word of God. And, and we challenge and we put everything the world says, everything that the preachers say, everything that the church says as a whole, we put it against scripture and we allow that knowledge and that truth to set our foundation. That's where we go. It's not just, well, they've, they know what they're talking about because they sound really, really smart. They speak with a sense of authority. That was one of the things they taught us in some of the biblical languages classes. Is if you can't pronounce the name, say it with a sense of authority because no one else in the room can say it either. Right? We just, okay, man, he knows what he's talking about. I'm going to believe it. Right? We, we kind of, we know not to worry about that in the world, don't we? But that goes for inside the church as well. Never take what I say to be it. Never take what anybody says from any pulpit as it. That's the final word. Always. Always judge it against Scripture. What does Scripture say? And if it's false, call it what it is. Before we go any further, let's open up with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I pray that as we continue on this morning, God, that every ear is made ready to hear, every mind made ready to understand your message, and every heart made ready to accept and apply whatever it is you have for each one of us today. God, we thank you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now I'm just getting started. Uh, I promise it's not going to be an hour long. Uh, but I want to draw your attention back to the illustration I brought up a few minutes ago about walking through the rough past the unsure footings. Right? Regarding worldly principles and teachings, you're never quite sure you're going to land on solid ground because the principles and values of this world are constantly what? Changing. Oh boy, you guys are paying attention today. So we're going to have three lessons this morning. Lesson number one, worldly values are what? Inconsistent. So I'm going to illustrate this point with something that we are all familiar with. One of the primary uh, mo uh, mottos of the kingdom of man, right? Not kingdom of God, but the kingdom of man, is to follow your heart and do whatever makes you happy. These principles sound good. Right? They, make us, they make us feel good, like, oh, this is the right thing to do because it makes me happy. The problem is they're inconsistent. It's shaky, and it contradicts the teachings of Scripture. Look at Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? So if it makes you feel good in your heart, is that something we should trust? No, because if you've ever been in love, if you remember back in seventh grade when you were just in love and the most beautiful thing in the whole world, everybody's laughing because we all, we remember even if it's embarrassing, right? We tell our parents, I love them. No, you don't. You don't know what love is, right? Winds change, something happens and you move on, right? Our hearts, they're fickle. Emotions come and emotions go. God remains the same. So the world says that you need to make sure that you're happy no matter what. 
Well, what do you think Jesus has to say about that kind of mindset? Well, I've got your answer for you. Matthew chapter 10, verse 39. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. The world says that you need to make sure that you're happy no matter what, but Jesus says we should lose our lives for his sake. Meaning sometimes the things we don't want to do and aren't going to bring us the most joy are the things in the long run will make us happy and bring us the most joy. Right? We trade all the stuff that makes us happy on, uh, on earth and build these earthly kingdoms for the things of God's kingdom, which are amazing. Right? We find deep and everlasting joy in the service of God. Now, the problem with your heart is the fact that your heart is inconsistent. Always changing, falling in and out of love with any number of things. Happiness is an ever-moving target from one day to the next, sometimes from hour to hour. So I want you to ask yourself an honest question. How can you build anything stable off of those worldly principles? But what makes you happy? What makes you happy? Now, as you think about that, flip over to Matthew chapter uh, 7. In this passage, Jesus is teaching his uh, Sermon on the Mount. We're going to look at verses 24 through 27. Jesus says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. Like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. I love this scripture for many, many reasons. Uh, but in here we get this picture of real biblical truth about how life is going to get hard. He says, when the storms come. When the rain comes in torrents, right? When the waters rise and the winds beat against the house, right? He restores our soul in what? When you just saying about it, in the valley. When things get hard, when life gets tough, when our foundations are on biblical truth, on the bedrock, you withstand the storm. You make it through the valley. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I sure feel near evil, right? We know we're going to walk through it. We know it's going to get hard. But when your foundation is in a place it's supposed to be, in God, and on God only, you weather the storm. You make it through. You may be battered and tired, but you're through it. Now, when your foundation is built on the things of this world, and the winds come, and it beats on it, and the floodwaters rise, your house is gone. It won't last. It's like shifting sands. So Jesus himself is commanding us to listen and obey to his teachings. This should be obvious, right? But we still struggle with this from time to time. But when we do listen and obey, right, we stand on that firm foundation. We can, we can be guaranteed, secure in that. So I'm going to speak from a personal experience when I tell you that out of uh, many values, right, that the world will throw your way, none of them will allow you to stand firm when you get tired and when the world gets tough. Right? They're shifting sands. You make decisions you shouldn't make. You say things you shouldn't do. You do things you shouldn't do. So knowing this, right? knowing that the world's values are shifting, they're not secure, they're, all these other things we've talked about, why are they so attractive? Right? If we know that they're not going to lend well, why do we still do them? Why does it sound so appealing to follow my heart, seek out whatever makes me happy, and all those other things? Why are they so appealing? Well, it brings us to lesson number two. Worldly values, they're seductive. They tempt you. They ease you in. Another word for seductive is enticing. Right? They entice you. Oh, that sounds nice. Maybe I'll just do a little bit. Right? Either way, the truth is, Many things and words the world tries to give us and, and tell us can look and sound very attractive when we see and hear them in the beginning. Believe it or not, the Bible even talks about this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. For a time is coming 
when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow to their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject truth and chase after myths. Now this sounds like the world, doesn't it? It sounds like all those people that don't know Jesus and are running far from him. Is that what this scripture is about? No. The scripture is for the church. Paul is writing to the church. He's writing to those who call themselves Christians, those who said, I believe in Jesus. Three and four was written for them. It's not written for the world. We apply it that way because it makes us feel better. This is written for you and for me. Right? This, is, this is what happens when we allow worldly influences to, to get into our hearts and entice us to something that makes us feel better. I like what he says. He made me feel good. I didn't like that part. It hurt my feelings. The way I look at this is if you don't feel like your toes are stepped on when the word of God is shared, two things have happened. One, either whoever is giving that message did not do their job, or two, you were not listening. Because the word of God will always convict us and call us to something greater. I'm not saying it makes you feel terrible and like this big, right? But we should walk out being convicted of something that we need to change, something we need to do, right? Our goal is to be better today than we were yesterday. Paul knew many people would spend their entire lives searching for a truth that lined up with their lifestyle. In addition, many people reject the truth in Scripture because it contradicts their lifestyle. I want to live this way, so I'm going to find somewhere that makes me feel good about it. They receive something meant to bring conviction and ignore it as useless because it makes them feel better, feel like they, they need to change. Because of this danger, right, we have to be people who continuously fill our ears and our minds with the only truth that we can find in this world, and it's the pages of Scripture. It's God's Word. The Bible is full of practical life principles that enable us to live the abundant life that Jesus came to bring us. In John chapter 10, Jesus specifically tells us uh, that this is the goal. Look at John 10.10. 10. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. What the devil can't fully destroy, he will seek to distract. If he can't take it away from you completely, he will distract you from it. It's kind of like uh, babies and shiny things. You try to distract them so you can do something. If you're going to get a baby a shot, you try to distract them and get them focused over here so you can. Same thing happens to us with the devil. We try to think it doesn't because, well, I'm not a baby, right? But if he can't take it from you, he's going to distract you with something else. Because the problem is, is when you take your focus off of God, it is put onto something that is not of God. So he tries to distract us. That's why we have to stand firm on the word of God. Right, to be on that bedrock foundation. That's why we have to abide in Jesus and in Jesus alone. It is never Jesus and, it is Jesus Christ, period. That's why we need to have daily time in God's word. That's why you pray daily, is to help protect yourself against all the deceit and the enticement of the world. Now as you learn how to point out the worldly values that do not align with the kingdom of God, you need to also spend energy pursuing the values that do align with the kingdom of God. Like I said earlier, knowing the difference is not enough. You need to pursue values and a lifestyle that does honor God. It's not, not enough to simply know, well, that's bad. Well, what do we do to correct it? Right? We live a life that's different than that. Bring us lesson number three, allow the spirit to guide. Again, it's not simply enough to say no to the things and the values of this world. We have to take a step further and say yes to the things of God. And this is, this is scary. This can take you places that you think you may not want to go. But if you allow God to guide you, I promise you, the places he takes you are exactly where you need to go. And God is going to do something huge in your life. Look at John 14, 17. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all what? Truth. All truth. 
The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. All truth, all truth because of the Spirit. Allow that truth to guide you. Allow that truth to convict you and call you to something greater. See, Jesus invites us to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. Once we begin to follow God's lead, we'll be able to experience the best life possible. And it may not align with what the world says is the best. A lot of times it won't. And that's okay. Because God's plan for you is greater than anything you could dream up or think of on your very best day. God wants the very best for you. Now there will always be temptations along the way to lead you off the path and go adventuring through the wilderness, the rough, those rough patches. But again, those temptations are only temporary. Your heart may feel like, man, that's the best thing ever. But when it begins to wear off, it tends to be hollow or empty. So you try to fill that hole in your heart with something else that feels like it fills that hole for a little bit, and then it begins to become hollow and empty again. The only thing that can fill that void in our hearts is Jesus. Abundant life, and I mean real abundant life, is found in the kingdom of God. And the Holy Spirit was given as a gift to help lead you that way. Now the world is trying to draw you into values that are inconsistent, that are seductive and destructive. The first step in battling against the world's call on your life is to call out and recognize any false truths or principles you may believe in. Allow the Holy Spirit to convict you in your beliefs and that the beliefs that you hold that are not scriptural, get rid of them. Cut them off, lop them off, throw them into the fire. Allow the Spirit to do that. It will be uncomfortable and it might be a little painful but they're bad. They're dead parts that need to be removed. The next step is admitting uh, how enticing and attractive some of these principles are. Why would they be that way? Admitting those things, finding the reasons for it. It does you no good to pretend like they aren't real and that you aren't drawn to them. You pretend like it's not a real threat and what happens? Before you know it, you're lost in it. All right, admit it, know that they're there. It also does no good to think we, if we simply avoid the infectious false teachings uh, that it is rampant in our world simply because we don't like it. Now this, this is going to sound kind of foolish, but you want to know how we do that? If you've ever had a, a little kid, a toddler, what happens when they cover their eyes? They believe if I don't see it, it's not real. It's not there. Is that the reality? No. If I cover my eyes, you guys are still there. So are those false teachings. So are those temptations and those enticements. You can pretend like they're not there all day, but they're there. And when we pretend, when we ignore, we give them a foothold. We give them away in the back door. Call it what it is. Own it. Live it and give it to God. And finally, we must, we must trust and the Spirit to lead and guide us into and through the truth. Now, into and through may be the valley. God may call you out and convict you in something that you believe that is false. And to get rid of that means you're going to go through a tough time. You're going to go through the valley, and things are going to get dark, and they're going to get hard. But oftentimes, it's in the wilderness where God does his best work in us. Because in those dark times and in the wilderness, where do you go for strength? Where do you go for hope? You go to him. God, I can't do this. I need you. Which is what we should be doing all the time. But we tend to wait until it gets really hard before we go to God. But he's standing right there and he gets you through it. So will you choose today to take a stand? Not just today, because it's Sunday. right? Everybody's like, yeah, of course we will. It's church. But what about tomorrow? What about Tuesday? Or the worst day of the week, Wednesday? What about tomorrow? What about next week, next month? Will you choose to stand firm in God every day? Will you choose to trust the leading of the Spirit no matter where God leads you? Will you make a daily commitment to Scripture? Make a daily commitment to God. 
If you can make those commitments, if you can begin that journey, I can promise you your life will get better. It may not get easier. Now, don't go put words in my mouth and say, well, preacher said it's going to get easier. No, more than likely it's going to get more difficult. But it will get better. I promise you. Scripture tells you that. So in a moment, we're going to exit on, on worship. What it is, it's song. We're going to be praising God. So I, I stand and praise God for who he is and what he's done for you already and what he's willing to do for you tomorrow. And then I'm going to challenge you to stand firm in your faith over the next week. Let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I, I thank you for today. God, I thank you for this opportunity that we have had to come together as a family. God, to worship you openly. God, to worship you together. And God, I challenge each person here and those who are watching online uh, to not walk alone. God, to bring in a brother or sister into our struggles to help us carry that load. And, and more importantly, God, that we would bring whatever it is to the foot of the cross. And God, that we would, we would openly and give it to you and allow you to begin your restorative work in us. God, we thank you for your son, the sacrifices that have been made on our behalf. God, we love you. It's in Jesus' most holy, powerful, and precious name we pray. Amen.